Farmer's wife Enid Sinfield was baling hay at Dunhouse Farm, Kensworth, on the edge of Dunstable, when she spotted a man's jacket in a bed of nettles. Jumping down from the tractor, she saw it was bloodstained and shouted for her husband, Tony. Going to investigate, they looked inside a shed and could see a shoe protruding from beneath some sacks of rubble. Sinfield pulled back the sacking and was shocked to find the dead body of a man lying on his back. It was Thursday morning, the 25th of August 1960. Sinfield quickly summoned the local police. A constable rushed to the scene, confirmed the gruesome discovery and after a local doctor certified death, Detective Chief Superintendent Charles Barron, the head of Bedfordshire Constabulary, wasted no time in calling for assistance of Scotland Yard. Detective Superintendent Dennis Hawkins was placed in charge of the investigation, and later that afternoon, with his assistant, Detective Sergeant Roy Habersham, and Home Office pathologist Dr Francis Camps, they arrived at the scene. As efforts had clearly been made to conceal the body, the old corrugated shed was well hidden from the main road by thick hedgerows, Hawkins suspected at once that the killer was almost certainly a local man. From an army pay book in his jacket pocket, detectives identified the victim as 25-year-old Keith Godfrey Arthur, and Camps was able to state that Arthur had died of a gunshot wound to the neck, but from the lack of blood beside the body had almost certainly been killed elsewhere. At first light on the following morning, dozens of police officers scoured the nearby fields, looking for the murder weapon, but without success. Keith Arthur lived in Dunstable and was married with two children. He worked at a local factory as a machine operator and also bought and sold second-hand cars. The police also learned he was a heavy drinker and was said to be something of a braggart. Hawkins held a murder investigation briefing that Thursday evening at Dunstable Police Station, where a young policewoman mentioned she had seen a trail of blood in Regent Street in the town centre and wondered if this may be linked to the murder. Keen to follow up any possible lead, Hawkins agreed to check it out and on the following morning, along with the young policewoman and Scotland Yard photographer, Detective Sergeant George Salter, he went to investigate. The trail of blood led to a public lavatory, where large amounts of blood were found by the wash basins. As the officers were gathered at the entrance taking photographs, a woman came out from across the road and asked if they were detectives. Told they were, she explained they were wasting their time, as she had a dental practice across the street, and many of her patients would call into the public toilets to spit out blood after having teeth extracted. Still convinced she was onto something, the policewoman said there was a trail of blood going the other way, which led to nearby Edward Street. The police photographer was capturing the red trail, which led past a row of terrace houses, when a woman opened the front door and told them her 14-year-old daughter had witnessed something shocking at a nearby house. She said her daughter Patricia would often babysit at number 64, the home of Jack and Margaret Day, and on Tuesday evening, August 23rd, Patricia and school friend Marie Davis were babysitting at the Day's house. Just before 9 o'clock, Margaret Day asked the girls if they would run an errand, and they both left. Marie decided to head home, and Patricia returned to the house alone. Arriving back, she saw the front door was open, and stepping inside, saw Mrs Day talking to a man she hadn't seen before. They were discussing a gold bracelet, and the man showed it to Patricia as she entered the house. Moments later, Jack Day returned, and the two men seemed to be having an argument. The man said to Day, Are you going to buy me a drink? To which Day retorted, What are you doing here? Patricia could tell the tone of conversation was distinctly unfriendly, and Day was seemingly accusing the other man of being too friendly with his wife. She said Day had then mumbled something she couldn't make out before pulling out a pistol, pointing it at the man and pulling the trigger. Without waiting to see what happened next, the young girl had ran home. Hawkins went across to the house and spoke to Mrs Day. She said her husband was at work and Hawkins said he would return later, and a watch was kept on the house. That Friday evening, the 26th of August, after Day failed to return home and following a tip-off, officers entered the Horse and Jockey pub on nearby Watling Street and arrested Day for the murder of Keith Arthur. What me? Day laughed. This is ridiculous. You have the wrong man. Remanded in custody, evidence quickly began to pile up against him. Witnesses were spoken to who saw Jack Day and Keith Arthur staggering down the street at about 9.30pm. They appeared to be drunk and Arthur was being supported by his friend. Another witness said the friend seemed to be bleeding heavily. Forensic examination by Dr Louis Nichols, head of Scotland Yard's forensic laboratory, found that blood on Day's clothing was the same type A as Keith Arthur's, and traces of soil and debris on his clothes matched those found at the farm shed. Day was also found to have honed at various times almost 200 antique firearms, plus a collection of swords and daggers, 
and in a storeroom where he worked, the police found an Enfield 38, which had been used to kill Keith Arthur. Forensic tests found that it was in good working order and unlikely to discharge accidentally. It was also suggested that the gun had been fired from just a few inches from the victim. On the following morning, Jack Day asked to speak to Superintendent Hawkins and made a written statement. I came home from the horse and jockey, parked my car and went indoors. Keith was there. I hadn't seen him for some time. I said hello to him like you do. I went to take my clothes off as I got indoors. The wife and babysitter were there. That is why I cannot understand how it happened. I took my gun out of my pocket. It was in a handkerchief. I put the gun down on the settee. The next thing I know, the damn thing went off. Keith was sort of standing there. I said, blimey, sorry it happened. And he said, it has got me in the throat. It looked as though it had been a scratch light. I gave him my handkerchief to put on it. I had two handkerchiefs, one on the gun and another in my pocket. Day then claimed that he and Arthur went into the town centre, but unable to find anyone to help, he had panicked when his friend collapsed. He drove to the farm, owned by some distant relatives, and concealed his friend in the shed beneath the sacks of rubble. Charged with capital murder, Jack Day went on trial at Bedford Assizes in January 1961 before Mr Justice Stretfield. The crime was represented by Arthur James QC and Mr Abrahams, while the defence was handled by John Hobson QC and Mr E.F. Jowett. Opening for the defence, Hobson said that while Jack Day was not insane, he had the mind of a child. Day gave evidence for three hours in the witness box. He maintained the killing of Keith Arthur was accidental. Despite his impressive arsenal of weapons, police learned that Jack Day had been using guns from the age of five, yet had never possessed a gun license. He said he was carrying the revolver in his pocket to shoot pigeons, and admitted he had been fined twice for not having a license. Asked to explain why he had hidden the body, Day simply said he had gone mad, telling the court, I wanted to give myself up but couldn't, I hadn't the courage. Day was also known to have a jealous temper, and one of his neighbours testified he had told him, in front of his wife, he would shoot anyone who had an affair with her. Day denied the prosecution's claims he intended to kill Arthur in a jealous rage. In her evidence, Day's wife Margaret said the whole incident was over in a split second. She had been talking to Keith Arthur, then in the next moment she saw him grab his throat as if he was having a fit. She claimed she had heard no gunshot. Two ballistics experts were called, and although meant to be providing evidence to help Jack Day, the one for the defence actually concurred with his prosecution colleague that the gun could not have gone off by accident and that it required great strength to fire it. Day seemed distinctly uninterested throughout the trial, often breaking into bouts of laughter and had to be scolded by the judge, reminding him of the seriousness of the matter. On January the 20th, after a three-day trial, the all-male jury retired for just 20 minutes to reach their verdict. Asked if he had anything to say, Day replied, No, only I am not guilty, sir. I didn't pull the trigger. The judge then sentenced Jack Day to suffer death in the manner authorised by law. Jack Day's mother had to be dragged screaming from the court, shouting at the judge, You have sentenced an innocent man. You will regret it. Removed into the corridor, she then collapsed in a faint. After the trial, it emerged Day had refused his counsel's advice to plead guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, with one medical witness describing Day as a psychopath. Initially, Jack Day refused to appeal, as he said he was innocent of the charges, and the date of execution was fixed for Tuesday, February 7th, 1961, to be carried out at Bedford Jail. Following pleas by his family, who Day refused to allow visit him in jail, he relented and made an appeal against the sentence. This was dismissed on March 6th, and despite a petition for mercy, claiming it was a crime of passion, Home Secretary Richard Butler refused to grant a reprieve. Day's revised date of execution was then set for March the 29th at Bedford Prison. Three days before, on Sunday the 26th, the Spectator magazine ran a feature on execution since the Homicide Act of 1957, and the article mentioned the murder of Keith Arthur and that Jack Day had been executed. Believing this would impact on his chances of having his sentence commuted, Day launched a writ for libel against the magazine. On the following morning, Day received the news in the death cell that his reprieve had been refused 
and therefore the writs he had issued would die with him on the scaffold. There hadn't been an execution at Bedford Jail since 1940, and as a result of it being used so sparingly, the execution chamber was never modernised, and the scaffold was housed in a small detached building in the prison grounds, situated some 50 yards from the condemned cell. Hangman Harry Allen had been present at that 1940 execution as a newly trained assistant, and had noted in his diary how the prisoner had been so overcome with terror on the morning of the execution, he had to be carried across the yard to the gallows. Jack Day maintained his courage to the end, and at 8 o'clock, as Allen and assistant Harry Robinson escorted him to the drop, he turned to the executioners and said, I am sorry I did it, I really didn't want to kill him. The most remarkable thing about this case involves the female officer and the trail of blood. The initial investigation and the trail turned out to be a false lead, the blood simply being from dental patients, but then a second trail took detectives onto Edward Street and the mother of the young babysitter who had witnessed the murder. Amazingly, that trail of blood turned out to be red paint, but even more extraordinary was on the other side of the street was the actual blood stains caused by Jack Day leading Keith Arthur away from the house, initially in search of help, but then to his final resting place beneath those sacks of rubble. The gallows at Bedford was to be used just one more time, 12 months later, when James Han Ratty was hanged for the controversial A6 murder. The scaffold stayed in place until hanging was abolished in 1969 and the building converted into a photographic studio, where new inmates had their photographs taken on admission. It was demolished in the autumn of 1993. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hangman's Record, and also check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find out more about my books and order copies of The Hangman's Record at a special subscriber price. Please also follow me on Facebook on my Hangman's Record page, where we can discuss this case and other episodes in the series.